Let's go here. Thank you for joining our study in the Gospel of John today. We're in chapter 17. And tonight at 7 o'clock, Justin Williams will be talking about this passage on the Maywood Facebook page. I sure hope to see you then. So beginning with verse 1, we read, After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you've given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all whom you've given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. Well, in the presence of Jesus' close followers, he had a talk with his Father. And he wanted people for all of history to know both the content of his prayer and also how to learn how to pray from him. So Jesus prayed to the Father as a son, and he tells us that we have the very same access to the Father. The disciples didn't ever ask Jesus how to preach or how to heal or how to do a miracle, but they did ask Jesus how to pray. And Jesus' answer was, when you pray, say this, Father. So he gave us the freedom to speak to God as our Father. What I have to do is I have to remind myself that Father is not just a title, but it is the reality of my position before God. And one of the ways that I do this is I read the book of Ephesians. In fact, I read a chapter, and I read chapter 1, and then I read chapter 2, and then I read chapter 3. And I take some of the themes out of each of those chapters, and I speak to God about them, and I also declare them to myself. This is who I am. It builds up my faith. It grows me. Let me give you an example. If we go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I can say, I am chosen by God in Christ. Verse 5, I am an adopted child. That is reality. So when I pray to God, I'm not praying to God uh, with a title, our Father. I am his child because I'm adopted through Jesus. Verse 7, I'm redeemed and forgiven. I can talk about I am redeemed, I am forgiven. Uh, verses 8 and 9, by God's grace I know his will and I can pray for it to be accomplished. That's so important. And so I have some other things listed in the real-voices.com blog going all the way from chapter 1 through chapter 3 and they're all simply declarations of who we are. Let's maybe finish this off with uh, chapter 3 verse 20. I can declare God is at work in me to accomplish abundantly more than I can ask or imagine. Think about that when you pray. God, when you pray, is accomplishing something through you. Okay? So I really encourage you to try some of this. You might want to read the blog, uh, real-voices.com, or better yet, get out the book of Ephesians and just read through chapter 1, 2, and 3 and see what it has to say about who you are as a child of God. I think it will really help your praying. So that's the example of Jesus' prayer. Now let's talk about the content of his prayer. In verse 1 he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that your Son may glorify you. If there's anything abundantly clear about Jesus' ministry, it is that Jesus came to glorify the Father. So if we start in John chapter 1 verse 14, we learn that Jesus came to display God's glory, full of grace and truth. John chapter 12, uh, Jesus spoke of being glorified, but it's not like humans are glorified. He saw his glory of that as a seed planted to die in the soil for the purpose of giving life to countless numbers of people. And then he was, as the same chapter, chapter 12, as he's contemplated the agony of death on the cross, he prayed. What did he pray for? He prayed for God's name to be glorified. And then the Father spoke out of heaven and he said that his name had been glorified and would be glorified again. So the glory that is revealed by the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is always, without exception, the revelation of his essential nature and character. So with the cross and resurrection, people of all ages have the opportunity to learn what God is really like. He's totally loving, personal, faithful, just, and holy. Well, 
Jesus taught us to pray the same content. We are to pray, hallowed be your name. That's in the great Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 9, and also a version of that in Luke chapter 11. Uh, this is, should be the first item on our prayer list. And we could also echo Jesus' words in John 17. And we could pray, Father, glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. The question is, why is it so important that the world begins to appreciate the nature and the character of God? We can understand that by looking at the other side. What happens when a nation forgets what God is like? So in the book of Jeremiah, we find a whole nation of people who forgot who God was, and it was to their deep regret that they did so. I'm going to read you some verses from Jeremiah and make a couple of comments. I think, again, you can hear these. So Jeremiah chapter 2, uh, this is what is said. Hear the word of the Lord. What wrong did your ancestors find in me that they went far from me and went after worthless things and became worthless themselves? Can you sort of hear the pain in the father's voice? He asks, what did he do wrong that they turned away from him? He cares for a prodigal people. He grieves over how they have become worthless. How about another passage? Jeremiah 2 verse 8. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handled the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, and they went after things that do not profit. So there in every society, there are people who are tasked with the responsibility of knowing and doing God's will. Well, the priests, ministers, preachers, pastors, teachers, didn't take the time to find out where's God. Have we lost sight of God? Those who handle the law, the people who studied the word of God, they didn't even know God. The rulers who, who should know that there is a no trespassing sign set up by God for ethical behavior walked right on past that trespassing sign and transgressed against him. And prophets who are supposed to speak for God rather spoke for Baal. Baal is a substitute for God. He was a fertility God during that time and the result was none of this behavior profited them at all. How about another passage again from chapter 2? Has a nation changed its gods even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out for themselves cisterns, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. Again, can you feel the pain of God in these verses? The people whom he loved changed from he at him, the one true God, to idols who are in fact no gods. I don't know about you, I've had one drink from a cistern. Uh, we were visiting when I was a child with some people and they took the runoff water from the roof of their place out in the country. They collected it into a metal bin and we were supposed to drink that stuff. It was the absolute worst water in the world. I've also had wonderful spring water that was the best you could ever have. Can you imagine people choosing cistern water over spring water? Can you imagine choosing false gods over the one true God? Well, when we pray, hallowed be your name, we are asking God to continue to reveal his character. And Jeremiah speaks for God, and he tells us what it's like to see God's honor. So one more passage from Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Do not let the wise boast in their wisdom. Do not let the mighty boast in their might. Do not let the wealthy boast in their wealth. But let those who boast boast in this, that they understand and know me, that I am the Lord. I act with steadfast love justice and righteousness in the earth for in these things I delight says the Lord I want to talk to you for a moment about another doctor another Jeremiah and this is Dr. David Jeremiah he's a very well-known radio preacher and has a very big ministry and very respected ministry so he was recently asked to give his views about the coronavirus and God's will and I ran across an article I'd like to read to you what he had to say 
Jer Jeremiah said, We are a great country. There's no question about it. We have the greatest economy in the history of the world. We are a nation of self-made people, according to them. If we're not careful, we can begin to think that we are the master of our own souls in charge of our own fate. Jeremiah continues, God sometimes just reaches down to remind us. You think you've got this thing under control, but I can take a germ you can't even see and bring you to your knees. Well, every time we pray, hallowed be your name, we're asking God to reveal his character to a world that desperately needs to know who he is. So, I plan to go through John 17, this great prayer, rather slowly and patiently. And I would really ask you today to turn to the book of Ephesians and let it remind you of your place, your responsibility, and your power in prayer. And I'd also ask you to begin praying fervently for God's name to be hallowed. Let's ask God to reveal his nature to the world and to draw us once again to respond to his glory. Pray with me, please. Dear God, you're amazing, and we pray today that you glorify your son Jesus so that he will glorify you throughout the earth. And we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Well, thanks for being a part of this. I pray that God blesses you. Look forward to seeing you tonight at 7 o'clock when Justin talks. God bless you.